conflict. Joining me right now is AFPI senior fellow and chairman of the China Policy Initiative. Steve Yates is here, the former deputy national security advisor to Vice President Dick Cheney. Steve, it's good to see you. Thanks very much. It's a, I don't know, do you think it's a different CCP today than when you were studying and working with Dick Cheney on this? Very much so, Maria. It's one of the key hallmarks of Xi Jinping. Uh, from the time of Deng Xiaoping's uh, efforts to sort of normalize China through the Reagan years and the reform and opening period, all the way through up until Xi Jinping, they had this strategy of biding their time and hiding their capabilities. They would use charm on the outside. Uh, anyone who was shrewd would see that they were investing heavily in their military. They were taking a lot of our technology and doing the things that are of greater concern to us now. But Xi Jinping hides nothing on this, really. It's very open confrontation. And their foreign minister, undiplomatic as he is, is very playful in making fun of what the Biden administration is trying to do. He's basically saying, we don't need your guardrails. What are these diplomatic guardrails you talk about? And that's bureaucratic speak in D.C. that we want to have meetings because we think meetings will avoid conflict. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I, I, I also was taken by the guardrails comment, because I think that it's very much in step with the way the CCP acts and responds to point out things that are uh, sort of negative. So they're talking about the relationship between China and the U.S. going off the rails. Why use that term? It's very, uh, you know, obvious why they're using that term, because the U.S. has all of these trains going off the rails. And, you know, it's a <laughs> reminder of what's going on in America. Was that intentional? Which, when I read, I thought, oh, this is totally CCP intentional. Oh, it is. The, the CCP was founded on information warfare. It is at its heart and really only a political movement. It doesn't invent things. It doesn't develop things. It doesn't bring prosperity or peace. It engages in rhetorical political warfare. Uh, and especially in the recent years, I mean, from the first sit down that Xi's government had with the Biden administration, where they threw the national security advisor and secretary of state side to side like a rag doll using American political talking points deliberately to push back against the United States. Mm. This reference to guardrails is a suggestion that they're driving this train and you don't control the direction it's going to go. Yeah, I mean, Kaylee, the administration keeps saying we're not seeking conflict. Well, no kidding. We're, you know, we know that. We want competition. Yeah. But the, the other side is not playing that way. The other side is bringing conflict. It wasn't the United States who launched the surveillance balloon over our military installations. It wasn't the United States that covered up COVID-19 and, and, and refused an investigation into the Wuhan lab after we know it leaked there. Yeah, and, and I'm interested to hear um, what your thoughts on are how the U.S. government should be changing its posture towards China, because it's very clear that the Cold War with China is getting hotter. And clearly there needs to be some sort of steps that, that the U.S. is taking to address that. Um, so what should the Biden administration be doing now? Well, there were early steps in the former administration that should be accelerated that emphasized clean networks and clean supply chains with regard to technologies. There were efforts to begin strategic decoupling from dependencies. In the post-COVID, uh, that sensitivity was felt beyond tech into medical and other areas. All of that should be accelerating. There's some signs of life coming out of the Biden administration in terms of supporting or at least looking at a ban on TikTok and yeah. other political warfare and psychological warfare devices. So they're starting, but this ship is turning too slowly. Congress needs to push harder, and we need to push harder from the grassroots up and are, listen to our allies yeah. who are very concerned about what China's doing to them. Well, what I keep raising is the fact that China has most favored nation status when it comes to trade. Now, James Freeman, you wrote a great op-ed this week, okay. The Reagan Way, and you went back and brought back Ronald Reagan's speech, uh, speeches when he was talking and addressing to the Soviet Union. And how to, you know, attack the Soviet Union's attacks. What, what are your thoughts on that same question that Kaylee's looking for? Because you're talking oh, a lot about global trade, but this is a national security issue. Yeah, thank you. So it's uh, 40 years ago today, Reagan gives the uh, speech that outraged uh, the diplomatic corps, much of the media. He calls the Soviet Union the focus of evil in the modern world. And, and I think that is a, is a key to the Reagan success Moral clarity. I don't know if we're getting clarity in terms of the message from the current administration. 
so I guess I'd like your thoughts on that. And I have a follow up. But, but what do you think about the message that's coming from this White House? Well, the seeking of cooperation, I think, is Pollyannish. Uh, they, they're they very, very clear about pushing their way and taking advantage at this point. I, th- I would have thought that the stomping on freedom of, of the, in Hong Kong, the holding of political prisoners, including our friend Jimmy Lai, should be a very clear indication. Uh, I think that Speaker McCarthy indicating he'll meet with the president of Taiwan if and when she transits the United States in the near future is a positive sign to have a leader in in, the, in Capitol Hill saying that they'll stand by Taiwan. I hope he visits Taiwan the way Speaker Pelosi did, too, to yeah. show this is bipartisan. Oh, also, just All these things that, important. You mentioned that the Communist Party of China does not invent anything. Xi has been aggressively going after entrepreneurs in that country. Do you see any possibility that there is an internal threat to his regime? Well, there are threats everywhere, but he has been more successful than any communist leader since Mao at going out and neutralizing or eliminating those challenges. And he's proven a willingness. So he has domestic deterrence very well on his side. And we have failed to make international deterrence a, an effective way to contain the malign influences of his party, which yeah. is the enemy of the Chinese people and our way of life. And, and the question becomes why? Why, why? I mean, we see this clearly. Why isn't the administration seeing this for what it is, Steve? Well, part of it is because it's hard. And most and the, the first instinct in government is to do things the easy way, which is mm. to have meetings and have summaries of conclusions. But this is hard. This is something the American people need to know and prepare for and mobilize for. If we do so, we will overcome it. But if we sit back and just play receiver in this game, then the odds are not in our favor. Is there any chance the most favored nation status has changed because of China's provocations? Would they roll back the most favored nation status? And do you think that uh, would be something that would put a scare into into the CCP to stop the stealing of intellectual property, the surveillance programs that are embedded in this country? It would be a very important marker to set. It wouldn't necessarily change trade flows immediately, but Beijing hated the annual debate about the renewal of most favored nation status. Its prize was getting permanent normal trade Mm. and the entry into the WTO. This would be an acknowledgement that that 20 plus year experiment has not brought positive returns. All right, Steve, we'll leave it there. Please come back soon. A conversation we will continue to have. Steve Yates joining us this morning. Stay with us. We'll be right back.